In this video, I'm going to be showing you how to install Docker and deploy your first container. This is a major milestone in our home lab journey and should give you all of the basics needed to go and expand your home lab. For this video, I recommend using Ubuntu server. However, you can use the Ubuntu desktop we installed in the last video or any other version of Debian. If you haven't completed your homework from the last video and don't have a version of Ubuntu server installed, don't worry, I'll put that up on screen now so you can follow that. Whilst that's installing, I wanna to talk to you about a couple of other tools that will be really useful for not only this video, but your life with Linux and remote machines. I wanna talk about two key pieces of software. The first one is called Putty, and that is an SSH client. So similar to how you connect with RDP for Windows and GUIs, etc., SSH will give you a similar experience, but for the command line in that shell. One thing I recommend you do while installing Ubuntu server is to select install the SSH agent when prompted to. Putty brings with it many benefits, not only the possibility to save configurations and connection settings, etc., uh, but you can specify things like certificates, and it's all driven through a GUI, so it's quite intuitive and easy to use. The other benefits of PuTTY are around the actual operation. If you are simply double-clicking in the Hyper-V and you get the separate window that comes up, that's okay. It's akin to sticking in uh, a HDMI port and getting a desktop out of it. But if you want to do anything more advanced like copying and pasting, um, it really doesn't work well. So Putty gives you that functionality in an easy to use form. The second piece of software I recommend you download is called WinSCP. Now this is similar to Putty. It will create a shell connection to your Linux environment, but this makes the movement of folders and files much easier, very similar to a Windows experience. So you can copy files from the host or other virtual machines, physical machines, NASs, whatever you want really, you just need to create that connection. There are other uh, products you can use, and yes, you can do this from the command line, but hey, we're starting out easy here, and I found these tools really easy and made me feel right at home, and I still use them today. Okay, so let's begin. We're gonna open up our freshly installed Ubuntu server. We're going to log in. And this will show us a number of properties from the virtual machine. The important bit that we're looking for here is the IPv4 address for ETH0. And on here, you can see mine is 192.168.7.104. So now that we have that, we can open up Putty that we've just installed. On Putty, on the default screen, where the host name or IP address is, you want to type in 192.168 and then the IP address that is shown on your machine. So when I hit enter, you can see this window pops up. And so this is giving me a shell session into that virtual machine. So I'll put my credentials in that I used previously. And here you are presented with exactly the same screen as we had previously. So let's go ahead and close down the virtual machine window. And let's leave Putty open and we can expand that a little bit. To install Docker, it's as simple as visiting their website, selecting the operating system that you have and the type of installation that you want to do. So for this one, we're going to choose Ubuntu install and we're going to choose Ubuntu server. So let's copy and paste those commands into our terminal. You'll notice on the Docker website, there's a really handy copy symbol. If you click that, it will copy the command in that box. And then if you head over to your putty session and simply right click, you will see that that command is pasted. Now, let's have a look at this command so we understand what we're doing here. So the first thing you'll notice, and you need to get familiar with this, is sudo. Now, what that does is gives your current user, in this case, Docker for me, it gives them root privileges. So that means that they can escalate their privilege to run a command as though they were the root. So this is very similar to when you are installing an application in Windows and you get the UAC prompt comes up which says, do you want to install this application, yes or no? So here we see we are escalating our privilege. 
We're then doing apt get. Now, what does that mean? apt is short for aptitude, and this is the repository that Linux uses for all of its applications. So this gives you simple things like you can do sudo apt install and then an application name. And as long as that's referenced within its library, it will go and install that application. So here what we're doing is escalating the privilege and we're saying aptitude get an update. So that list of applications, we're saying we want you to update that list. Then on the next line, we're actually installing some of the dependencies we need for Docker. Now in this case with Ubuntu, partly one of the reasons why I chose this, is if we press return on there, we need to input our password because we are escalating. We'll press return again. You will actually see it going off and querying all of those different repositories. And you'll see here at the bottom, zero upgraded, zero newly installed, zero to remove and 43 not upgraded. So what that means is it's already installed. So let's move on to the next section. Again, we hit that copy, we come back to our terminal and we right click. Now, if we break this command down, what we're doing here, and I don't want to get into too much detail, is effectively using cryptography to verify the installation, i.e. we can prove that what we're going to install comes from the official Docker repository, and that's what we want. So let's go ahead and hit enter. Okay, no problems there. Let's move on to the next section. So in here, we're actually downloading the release the code names and all the versions that are available and we're adding those to our sources list which you can see in the bottom of that command so let's hit return again no errors that's great so now what we can do is go back to that first command that we issued and do an update so now when it does that update you can see get five and six so those are new because we've just added the docker repository so now what's happened is it's gone off and it's crawled those repositories and it said, hey, I know what Docker is now and I can install it. Excellent. So let's get on to the actual installation. So if we move down to the next one, sudo apt get install docker ce, docker ce command line interface, container dio, docker build plugin and docker compose plugin so these are all the core utilities that docker will use and all of its dependencies so if we hit enter there it's going to ask us to confirm whether we want to install and it will specify that at the moment that requires 396 megabytes of additional disk space let's press y and then hit enter Now hopefully that should complete and look exactly like my screen does. That means there weren't any errors and you've got Docker installed. Congratulations. So let's verify that it works. So if we go back to the Docker page and we do the hello world example. So let's copy that command and we're going to paste that into our terminal. So this is going to run a container called hello world. So when I did that, you'll notice that it said unable to find image hello world latest. Now you might be thinking, oh no, I have an error, but that's a good thing. So what it did first is look locally for that hello world image. Now obviously it couldn't find it because we don't have it. So then it goes off and queries Docker Hub and it looks for an image called hello world. It then pulled that container down. It then ran the container and that container is set to put out the input that you can see on the screen there and then it closed down and it deleted that image so great now docker's working so let's run our first container that we're actually going to be using now for this tutorial i'm going to choose portainer this provides a friendly and intuitive web gui that you can use to run pretty much all of the command line commands so let's get on to it Let's go to the Portainer website. Now for this, we want to install Portainer CE, not the business edition that requires a license. We want to set up a new Portainer server installation. Now you get three options there. You can do Docker standalone, which is what we're going to be setting up today. That means you have one instance of Docker running all of your containers, which is great if you only have one machine. 
Later on our journey, we will look to expand that. The next item you can choose is Docker Swarm. Now think of this as the first attempt at Kubernetes. So Docker created Docker Swarm to try and solve the problem of multi-host environments, i.e. you want high availability of all your containers across your estate. However, Kubernetes came along and did it better. So Docker Swarm is pretty much abandoned. However, it still does work and it might fit your needs. So let's go ahead with Docker standalone. We want to install Portainer CE with Docker on Linux. And there's basically two commands that we need to run here. So the first, we want to copy and we want to put sudo in front. Now you can add the Docker user to the sudo group so you don't have to keep typing sudo and perhaps I'll do that in the next video. But for now, let's type sudo and let's paste in the command on the Portainer installation guide. Now what this is doing is saying, hey Docker, I want you to create me a volume. Now this is a concept within Docker, a bit like setting up um, a hard drive or a storage space. It's saying create me a volume called Portainer Data and hopefully that's pretty straightforward why we'd want that. So let's hit return. And there you go, you get the printout of Portainer underscore data which shows that that volume has been created. So let's move on to the next command, which is where the magic happens. So first, let's type sudo, and then we'll hit paste. Now what this is doing, is it's doing the same as before, where we pull down that container, that hello world. So it's saying docker run, and then you'll notice dash d. So dash d is a daemon, which means it will run in the background, which is great, we want it to always be running. Dash p, you've probably guessed here, is the port number. Now the left hand number of the colon is the port on the host machine. The right hand number is the port on the container. Now this is really useful because you'll be running multiple containers and often those default ports will clash. Things like uh, traffic and Nginx for example, both use port 80 and this gives you the flexibility to change that. The next bit is self-explanatory, a name, we're calling it Portainer. We're specifying that we're going to start this always, so whenever this machine is booted, it's gonna run this container. We're gonna mount a volume inside the container. Now from the last video, I spoke about persistence. So this is an example of persistence. However, what we're doing here is passing through the Docker sock, which means Portainer will have the ability to run Docker commands. Now the second one, this is where we are actually mounting that volume we just created. So this is more true persistence. And the last part of that is we're specifying the image. So we're saying we want Portainer from the Portainer registry. The interesting bit is right on the end. So I mentioned this previously, that you can do version tagging. So for this one, we're going to pull the latest version. Now, good practice will dictate that you pin the version. And you might see people recommending... Um, containers such as Watchtower. Watchtower goes off and every time there's an update to an image it will automatically redeploy that. Now that might be fine for some of your applications but it's generally best to avoid because if there is a breaking change it's going to pull that down and all of a sudden Portainer is not going to work or it might be something you actually depend on for operations and you don't want that to go down. So let's run that command and see what happens. Again it cannot find that image locally, so it's going off to pull it. This time the image is a little bit bigger, so you'll get those download progress bars. And then just like that, it's completed without any error messages. So let's test that that's installed. So we can do sudo docker ps. Now what that does is it lists all of the containers that are installed on this machine. So you will see that Portainer is there, and it's been running for 14 seconds, which feels about right. You can also see that the container is exposed on port 8000 and port 9443. So let's open up our browser and see what happens when we navigate to that page. So Portainer runs HTTPS, even though it's using a self-signed certificate, and we'll get onto how we can fix that in later videos. So if we do HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash the IP address of your host, in my case that was 192.168.7.104 
and then we want to put colon 9443 because that is the HTTPS port that this container is running on as we just saw in the configuration. Now let's hit return. And just like that, we're presented with a page. So whilst this looks bad and isn't working, that's just because we're using a self-signed certificate. And in my instance here, Chrome's not happy about that. But we can, can, we can ignore that and carry on. And just like that, we're presented with the login screen. Excellent, you've just spun up your first container. So let's create a password and then we can log in. This is the administrative password. And excellent. There we go. We've logged into Portainer. We've created our admin user. So let's get started. Let's click that button there. And we want to live connect to our local instance. So let's click this blue button on the right. And there we go. We can see an overview of our Docker instance. So if we click containers, we'll see that there's two containers here. We'll see Portainer itself, and we'll also see, in my case here, you'll have a different name, Frosty Elgamel. Now, you might be thinking, what on earth is that? Now, in the previous container that we ran, we didn't specify a name. So when you don't specify a name, Docker will automatically generate one of these funny names. So it's safe to go and click that tick box there, and we can click remove. We can also say to delete non-persistent volumes, and then get rid of that. So that's pretty much it. Now you have Portainer installed and you have a nice and easy to use GUI for administering your Docker installation. From here, you can add a container, you can monitor containers, you can also go into a container, you can check its logs, which is really handy for diagnosing problems. You can also jump into a shell, so you can actually go inside of that container. And similar to what we did with Putty, we now have a command line interface inside that container. So now that we have Portainer installed, let's take a look around. One of the handy features that will be useful as a beginner is the app templates. So let's have a look in there. There's quite a few common applications that you'll recognize. So why don't we just pick one, something like, let's pick Nginx, so web server. So let's click that. We'll give it a name, Nginx, and then we'll hit deploy the container. Now, if we go back to our dashboard, you will see that Nginx is running. You'll also see the ports that have been assigned. So it's port 32769 on the host, which isn't the most intuitive, but as I've said before, we can specify that. And I'll actually be moving on to Docker Compose very shortly. So let's test it's working. The bit to remember here is on the left hand side on those ports. So we're going to connect on port 80, which is non HTTPS. So we don't need to type that. So we're just simply going to type 192168 and then put your IP address in. And then we want to do colon and then go back and check what that is for 80. So port 80 is bound to 32769. So let's put 32769 and hit return. There we go. Welcome to Nginx. It's that simple to spin up a web server. So I mentioned Docker Compose. Now you'll notice that we installed that earlier in the video. So why do I recommend Docker Compose over Portainer? Well, as we move on in this journey, we want to become more dependent on code, i.e. we want something that's easily repeatable and clearly defined. In this process, we're having manual steps. We're having to create Portainer, we're having to log into Portainer, we're having to click through templates and put in details. We don't want to do that. We want to rely on code. So how do we do this? So within your command line on Putty, you can create a new file, docker-compose.yaml, and put the config in there. And that's perfectly fine, and people like to use the command line. I do, but when I was starting out, I found something like that WinSCP really useful. So let's load up WinSCP. So when you first load up WinSCP, you'll have a blank screen. As you can see here, I have quite a few hosts, and hopefully I'll be getting you to that position in the future. But for now, let's create a new one. So we wanna click new site, 
and very similar to putty we put in the host name we put in the username and password we defined you can click save and you can save that password it's not recommended for obvious reasons but I'll let you decide for yourself and then we hit login now again it hasn't seen this service certificate before so it's going to say do you trust this one it's unknown yes now I didn't save the password so I'll put my password in and it's now taken us to the home directory on our Linux VM so you can do this any way you want but the way I do it or the way I did it was to create a new folder simply called docker compose go into that folder and then I would just create a folder for each of my applications let's deploy that nginx container again so I've created a folder I'm going to create a new file docker compose.yaml and I went on the docker hub website I looked for the nginx container and I'm just going to paste that code in here and I've added the version number at the top and the services and added an indent do make sure you do that otherwise the config file will be invalid so let's just have a quick look through here so we specified version 3 of docker compose which is fine that's the latest version there are subsequent subversions, but we don't need to worry about that we specify a service in this case we're specifying it as web that's the name of the service we're specifying the image simply as nginx this is going to pull the latest version we're specifying some volumes templates and that's going to be mounted into etc nginx templates we're specifying the ports let's mix that up a little bit make our lives easier let's change it from 8080 to just 80 that means we won't have to specify a port number when we're putting it into our browser then we're expressing two environment variables we're creating a host name this is just foobar.com you could change that to whatever your domain is later we're going to leave it as it is for now and we're going to stipulate that nginx is running on port 80 again you'd be able to change that if you wanted to so let's save that and we're going to go back to our putty session now we're going to cd change directory and we're going to start typing docker doc and your friend in linux is tab make use of tab so let's press tab it's going to do docker compose excellent that's what we wanted and we created a folder called nginx so if we just type n and press tab it's going to auto complete so now we're in that folder let's double check that our config file is there bingo there it is so now what we need to do is execute that file so we do sudo docker compose up dash d for that daemon now it's going to ask us for our password let's put that in then we're going to hit return you see very quickly it created the network it started the container excellent so let's verify that so back in portainer we can now see that we have another instance of nginx running this one's called nginx web one and again you can specify in that docker compose file the name that you want simply name colon give it the name you want so let's see now that's bound to port 80 so if we go into our browser and we do 192.168 you put your IP address in there and simply hit return we don't need a port number make sure it's not auto completing and there we have it nginx installed using docker compose excellent as I mentioned in my first video after this juncture I moved on to a dedicated machine so that's where we're going to be heading next the setup you currently have is going to be perfectly fine for the future videos however in the next video we're going to be setting up proxmox on a dedicated machine and replicating this environment that we have currently set up in hyper-v the good news is we can export this vm and i'll show you exactly how to do that in the next video